Hello, my name is Father Victor Brown, and I'm speaking to you from St. Dominic Church in that part of New Orleans called Lakeview. I have been involved with this church for some 20 years of my life, and now I'm retired here. And my good friend, the photographer, Mike Maples, has asked me to give you a few ideas about this church and the things that go on in it and the things that you will find in it. It's an interesting building, to say the least. Uh, he asked me also first to tell you something about my own background, which will be very brief. Uh, my mother and father lived in Hammond, Louisiana for seven years, and it was during that period of time that I was born. I was born here in New Orleans, but I went to live in Hammond. And when I was a little boy, uh, just hardly old enough to walk, my father used to invite me to go to Mass with him. He was a daily Mass goer. And I would go to Mass and I would look around the church and see things and I wanted to know what is that man doing up in the front of the church and why is he doing it? And my father explained to me as well as he could uh, what was going on, what the Mass was, what the Blessed Sacrament was, what Holy Communion was. And I decided at the ripe old age of three that when I grew up I wanted to be uh, the same kind of man that was up there in the front of the church and to be able to do the same thing, namely to offer the sacrifice of the Mass to our Heavenly Father and to be able to give a Holy Communion to the people that I knew. And it, that desire has never gone away. It's, in fact, it's, it keeps growing. It's through the grace of God. So here I am retired uh, in a Dominican church, which is the same kind that was uh, there in Hammond in those days. And here I am to try to tell you some of the things about this church. This church was built in 1961 after having been here in Lakeview in different places. Where, when it first came out to Lakeview, that is St. Dominic Parish, in 1924, we were farther down the street. We we're on Harrison Avenue. We were farther down Harrison Avenue toward the west. And when, that grew, when we outgrew that, we moved to where we are now. Uh, we first built a building that uh, was eventually to become the gym of our school. So what is now the, what is the second church is now the gymnasium behind where I'm sitting, behind the building in which I'm sitting. Well, that soon proved also to be too small. And so we then uh, uh, built this larger church in 1961 and we've had no trouble filling it uh, since then, uh, and here we are. It's an unusual church, uh, very large, and they tried to build it in such a way that there would be no obstacles to what we could see. There are no columns in the middle of the church to prevent you from seeing. Um, up at the front of the church, you see a beautiful white marble altar, which was um, quarried from marble in Italy and brought over here. It weighs several tons. The pedestal of the altar is surrounded by the picture, the statues of our Dominican saints and our Lord and his mother and people like that. And those are the things that you see both on the front and on the back of the, the, the altar. Um, above and behind the altar, you see a crucifix, an image of our divine Lord on the cross. And then there's one much larger than that in the back of the church on the left hand side as you go in that I can see from where I'm sitting. It's a magnificent piece of, of uh, architecture and of furnishings. Uh, on that side of the church where the crucifix is, what, what is now to my right, you see the side altars. You see there was a time when priests did not con celebrate mass. Every priest who wanted to celebrate Mass, celebrated his own Mass uh, and by himself. And so if, when you had a large number of priests in any given house, like a, a priory or a, a monastery or that, they all had to say Mass and they had to use different altars so that they could, they would all be, there would be time for everybody. And so that's why all those altars are present there now. We, we don't use them anymore, they're just there to be the pedestal, as it were, for the, over, the uh, representations overhead. Uh, okay, so on, the, on my left, on my right side as I, fa as I sit here, we have the side altars, and on my right, left side as we sit here, we have a number of 
uh, ceramics done by a priest. All of them were done by Father Angelo Zarlinga, one of our Dominican priests, who was given charge of the ornamentation of the church. And so you'll see over there on both sides of the church these large statues. They're, they're what we call bar reliefs, or high reliefs, I should say, of the various Dominican saints and our Lord and his mother and so forth. Um, behind and me, we have this huge mosaic representing St. Dominic, for whom the church is named, the founder of our religious order. The, uh, the direction in which I'm facing, the back of the church, we have a large stained glass window representing the transfiguration of our Lord with Jesus in the middle and Moses and Elijah on the two sides. Um, here you have a lovely black granite baptismal font. And on the top of the baptismal font is a statue of St. John the Baptist, who is uh, preaching to the people. And the reason for that being there is because there's a connection between John who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, and then those of us who baptize uh, either children or adults here in this, in this baptistry. I've done many baptisms here, and, and it's been used thousands of times since the church was dedicated in 1961. Uh, there was a time when the baptistry was actually outside the church. If you go to some of the great basilicas and cathedrals of Europe, you will find that the baptistry is not even in the same building with the church. But in order to indicate the fact that we, we enter the church by baptism, we enter the human church by means of our baptismal promises, our baptismal sacrament, and then we also enter the physical church by means of going past the baptistry into the church. So in most cases, uh, back in the old days, the baptistry was in the back of the church. Then this was put up front so that everybody could see the baptismal easily. And then up front, you will find uh, symbols of baptis baptism on the wall near the, where the baptistry used to be. You see water flowing down the front. Okay, uh, I was asked, why do we have statues of Our Lady in most churches, the, the mother of Jesus? Well, we have them because of her importance. Uh, she's the mother of God. It was she who brought our Lord into the world and gave him birth and n nourished him. Uh, and so we, we have a special, very special devotion to her, which is more than that to the other saints, the other members of the hierarchy. We also have a, a side altar way up in the front of the church over on what would be the left of Blessed John of Vercelli. He was a Dominican priest uh, who lived just shortly after St. Dominic himself, and he was the one who founded the Holy Name Society, an organization of men to sp give special honor to the, the name of Jesus. The statue of Blessed John uh, matches the one of Our Lady on the other side of the church. So as you look forward from back here, you will find Our Lady on your right, Blessed John of Vercelli on the left. He's called Blessed John because he has not been canonized yet. He's not officially a saint. He's what we call one step short of a saint, and we call that blessed. Behind the main altar, we have a grill, uh, which is made of brass, and it has a number of individual images of Dominicans, men, priests or brothers. They're, all the, all the uh, images of the men are exactly alike. They are identical, but they're all c holding different things in their hands to, to symbolize different aspects of our Dominican life. You have, uh, uh, for example, uh, f faith, hope, and charity, uh, the charity being a chalice, hope being an anchor. The anchor is always a symbol of the solidity and the importance of hope. You have a book indicating study, the life of study. You have uh, a penitential life indicated by a whip. Uh, and then there may be others that I can't see from here, but if you look uh, higher up in the, in, the, in the nave of the church, which is where we are sitting now, you will find a great deal of, uh, of stained glass. And that stained glass up there was uh, designed and executed 
by a German firm and he wanted to use something that would be a particularly appropriate to New Orleans and Louisiana. And so he went out into the swamps and he saw the, the uh, Spanish moss hanging from the trees and he saw the, the sun shining through the, the uh, swamps, the marshes. And so he decided that that's what he would do. So all of that, that vast expanse of window up there has to do with the fauna and the flora of Louisiana. But in the middle of each of those windows, you have some symbol indicating what these uh, windows are dedicated to. Back here, you have a crown and a, and a rosary indicating Our Lady Queen of the Holy Rosary. And then you have four roses indicating St. Rose of Lima, one of our first Dominicans in America. You have the, the Dominican shield, and then you have the crown of thorns because of some of our saints had a special devotion to our, lady, to our Lord and his passion. You have an, a, a hatchet because one of our first Dominican uh, martyr was, was killed by being, having his head chopped open. And then you have a torch indicating uh, truth and a, a trumpet indicating the, uh, the, the last trumpet the, uh, of St. Vincent uh, Ferrer. The ones on the east side beginning from the back and going to the front as you would when you walk into the church. The very first one shows uh, a, a chalice with a snake coming out of it. Uh, that, has, that symbolizes St. Louis Bertrand, one of our Dominican um, missionaries who went to Colombia during the uh, early days of, after the discovery of America. And one day a group of people tried to poison him. They put poison in his wine but he blessed the wine that he was about to drink, and the, according to the story, the, the, the poison turned into a snake, and, and he dropped it, and it broke, and that, so he was saved from, for that reason. And the second one, as we go, go forward, to a little, we have the word code, which with two uh, tables of the law, and that indicates St. Uh, Raymond of Penafort, who lived in Barcelona during the early days of the, church, the, of the order, and he wrote a, a code. Then number three, the third one, is St. John of Cologne. He was killed by people in the, during the time of the Reformation because he refused to give up his belief in the Blessed Sacrament. And so we associate him particularly with the Blessed Sacrament. And then number four, one of the... Uh, bishops of the church. You have a, that mitre, which is what the bishop wears on his head, and you have the crozier, special stick, if, if you want to call it that, that he carries to indicate the fact that he is a shepherd of souls. And that would be St. Antoninus, who is the Archbishop of Florence. Then you have a papal tiara, and the one papal the one holy uh, uh, pope that we have, the one who has been canonized, I should say, is St. Uh, Pius V, who gave us a special devotion to the rosary. And after Pius, the fi after Pius V, you have son and, and book. Those would be symbolic of St. Thomas Aquinas, who uh, was one of our greatest theologians of that time. And the last one, is St. Albert the Great with a beaker and book indicating um, modern science. Beakers are found in laboratories and that's St. Albert the Great who was both uh, a very great theologian and also the uh, patron saint of all those who are studying or teaching the natural sciences. On the east side of the church there are large ceramics which means figures of the saints which have been molded in clay and then fired in a kiln. And there's no kiln big enough to accommodate the whole thing. They had to be fired in, or baked in pieces and then glued together. So the, as we come into the church, we look to our right, and the first one we see, the first of the ceramics, indicates St. Margaret of Hungary. She was a princess of, the, of, of Hungary. She wanted to become a nun. Her father didn't want her to become a nun. He didn't want her to leave Budapest 
which is where they lived. And so he, she said, well, she wanted to go. He said, all right, I'll build you a monastery, but I want it right in the, in the, uh, in the middle of the river between Buddha and Pest. Buddha and Pest used to be two cities in those days. And so she lived there her, her whole life on there on the island. And we have a picture of her here shown with a, a crown on because she was a princess and she's holding a, a lily in her hand to indicate her, her purity. Then just on the other, the next one coming along is St. Peter of Verona. He was the first Dominican to be martyred. He was killed on the way by enemies of the church. He was killed north of Milan on the way to the city of Como. And as he lay dying, they, they killed him by hitting him in the head with, with a uh, hatchet. And uh, he dipped his finger in his blood and he wrote the credo. Credo in unum deum, I believe in one God, with his own blood as he was dying. There from on the other side of him you have Blessed uh, Imelda, a little girl who wanted very much to receive Holy Communion, but she was too young to receive Communion, and so uh, one, uh, while she was in church, the Blessed Sacrament uh, left the hands of the priest who was giving Communion to those who were properly prepared, and it flew through the air and uh, entered her tongue or her mouth, and thus she made her first communion and died at the same time, uh, the, the death of a very holy little girl. The one after that is Pope St. Pius X. He was the one who labored for the uh, renewal of the church, and he gave us the, the rosary. He asked that everybody say the rosary particularly. Uh, going toward the altar, you have St. Catherine of Siena, who was a great um, d defender of the church and the, pape, the popes, and she was one of the people who uh, did a great deal to um, bring the popes back from Avignon to Rome, where they belonged, and to give them uh, advice as to how to govern the church. Um, but beyond, beyond that, you have St. Vincent Ferrer, um, who is... Uh, one of our great missionaries from Spain who preached all over it Spain, Italy, uh, France, and even into Holland and Belgium. He was the, 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 the trumpet of judgment. On the other side of the church, beginning at the back, you have not a ceramic, but that beautiful crucifix that we talked about earlier, life-size or even slightly larger than life-size. And as you go forward from that, you find St. Mar Martin de Porres a Dominican brother giving food and, and, and various necessities to the poor. And if you notice, there are mice around his feet because they said he was so loving that he was even good to the, the mice in the convent where he lived. The next one after that is St. Albert, who is standing up with his miter and crozier, and St. Thomas Aquinas, his number one pupil, who is sitting down, and the two of them are uh, teaching. They're both Dominicans in their habits. Here, the next one you have after that is St. Jude, one of our 12 apostles, who has a special devotion uh, within our order. Uh, we have shrines to St. Jude in most of our churches because people uh, are so fond of him, uh, and they leave money at the, at the shrines to, and to help us with our work. Beyond that, you have St. Joseph. St. Joseph is there, the, the, the spouse of our Blessed Mother and the foster father of Jesus. The last of the uh, ceramics uh, closest to the side door going out of the church uh, represents the Sacred Heart of Jesus uh, as he appeared to St. Margaret Mary, showing his heart on the outside of his body, blow, glowing with love and kindness for the whole world. And now we want to put a, uh, give a little attention to our St. Joseph altar. When we speak of the St. Joseph altar, we're not talking about the permanent altar dedicated to St. Joseph, which we have in the church, but rather the, uh, the St. Joseph altars, which are made by people, especially of Italian descent, is here in New Orleans and Louisiana and that area. It, the idea originally came from the island of Sicily, off the southern coast of Italy, and they had a special devotion to St. Joseph. They would 
put up what they call St. Joseph altars in their homes and they would cook lots of food and uh, they, people would come and uh, leave money. Uh, they would take some of the food away and leave the money which was then used for the poor. So you have uh, here in New Orleans a special uh, tradition and devotion to St. Joseph on St. Joseph's Day which is March the 19th and we happen to be making this recording on March the 20th. So just yesterday we had the St. Joseph altar here and now we're going to go and take a look at it before they take it down for another year. And now we are coming to what we call the St. Joseph altar but this is not the permanent St. Joseph altar. This is the temporary one which is erected every year for St. Joseph's Day which is March the 19th and that happened to be yesterday because we're recording this on March the 20th, 2014. So as we come closer, we'll see several um, uh, alt, uh, uh, tables in a row. We have one table over here to my right uh, with a number of pictures on it and that's uh, a group of people who have lived in the parish and have died and people are memorializing them by having their pictures here. Now here we come to, to the St. Joseph's altar itself and you see a great deal of food here. Lots of bread, Italian bread, and you have the, the pasta, the spaghetti and noodles and all that kind of thing. And then sweets, various kinds of uh, cookies and Italian biscotti. And they are above, uh, uh, in the middle of the St. Joseph altar, you have a statue of St. Joseph himself, a nicely carved statue. Um, uh, these, we, these things are called fava beans, and they, they are blessed on St. Joseph's Day to indicate the importance of food and our being charitable to those who are hungry. And you, if you, if, uh, people will have them blessed and then take one home as a symbol of St. Joseph. So even beans can be valuable in terms of making uh, a connection between our necessities and the, the, the goodness of God. Here we have various kinds of things. St. Joseph was a carpenter and so here we have a, a uh, we have a, I guess it's a cookie, huh? A, a, uh, in, in the shape of a saw. You have the saw and you have the, the uh, ha hammer. All of these having to do with St. Joseph because he was a carpenter. And then all of these special um, um, candles showing St. Joseph's picture on the outside, especially when the candle is lighted. This lady, uh, the, there's a picture of her here. Her name was Linda Guastella and when when we f finally finished the big stained glass window representing the transfiguration of our Lord and at the back of the church she and her husband wanted to offer uh, to put uh, uh, lights there so that it could be shown at night and so I don't know whether those lights are still allowed to burn at night but if they were that it was there it was their contribution Linda and Ross Guastella who lived not far from him. But here's a a large monstrance uh, showing the Blessed Sacrament with the rays coming out as we have on the, the altar itself for real blessings, real uh, benedictions and these things are made in honor of, of the, the Blessed Sacrament. If you look carefully you'll see a large crab. You see a crab made of, of, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the bread dough. Of course bread wine, you, you also have the wine with the, um, the Italian Chianti uh, cases. And that's it. People will, will leave money here for the poor. Uh, we now come to the, uh, the end of our little tour of the church. Here we have the St. Joseph altar which will be taken down today. And over on the, side, the other side of the church we have a beautiful mosaic that was done by the Vatican Mosaic Workshop and blessed by the Pope, Pope uh, Paul VI, and given to the church by Father, Mr. DeMaio, a longtime parishioner here. And you see it over, over there 
on the east side. Then on this side of the church, we have a white marble statue of St. Michael the Archangel, which was a gift to us by one of our parishioners here. And that brings us to the end of the, our little tour, especially with the ringing of the Angelus, which is the daily uh, uh, bell ringing, uh, reminding us that the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. So now I ask the Lord to bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.